back projection because I figured we're going to be back and forth and so on. You please take your seats. Please take your seats, we can get started. seats, we really are going to start. If you're just watching, watch from somewhere more distant. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to a panel discussion on the science of climate change. Uh, my name is Bill Clark. I'm a faculty member here at the school and have been asked to moderate this panel which is the first of three that will be held as part of this year's annual spring exercise for the first year Masters of Public Policy class. Uh, as I think most of you know, subsequent panels will address both the economics and politics of climate change. Uh, this one is focusing on climate change science. Uh, our goal here this afternoon is to explore the state of scientific understanding about global climate change and the ways in which climate may be influenced by human activities. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce you to the scientists on our panel who will guide us through that exploration. First, however, to set the stage uh, for the discussions we're going to be doing for the rest of the afternoon, I want to say a few words to put our scientific understanding of climate change into context relative to our scientific understanding of other environmental or even non-environmental issues with which you might be more acquainted. Um, to caricature the situation only a little bit, most environmental policy dealt with in the world today turns out to have surprisingly shallow scientific foundations to it. This isn't because science doesn't know a lot or scientists don't work on things. Uh, it's because new environmental issues are coming along all the time, uh, but that applied work on those issues, be they uh, asbestos or uh, groundwater pollution or arsenic in uh, Bangladesh, uh, applied work on those issues, work that might actually be useful for policy, uh, is not really classy stuff to do. Uh, it is not what gets most scientists promotion uh, it is certainly not what gets them uh, recognition among the leaders in the field. It is not what gets them elected to National Academies of Science. Uh, as a result, for most such environmental issues, a few to a few dozen scientists, really good scientists, are involved. These folks are publishing perhaps a score of serious new research articles a year. And the emerging body of results from that research is synthesized seldom, uh, reviewed seldom, if at all, uh, and then mostly under the guidance of lawyers involved in some regulatory action or civil suit. What this means is that most of the time, most environmental science applied to public policy is a little bit idiosyncratic, uh, 
Most of the experiments underlying that science have not, in fact, been repeated often or ever. Most measurements and calculations involved have been done only once or twice. And that the understanding produced by these efforts may, in fact, be perfectly plausible and valuable. It may even be true. Uh, but by and large, it is not the kind of thing on which you'd wish to bet if you had an alternative. Our scientific understanding of the issue of climate change, I'd like to have you think about, is about as different from this picture of normal environmental science as you could possibly get. First of all, the topic is not new. Scientists have been considering the possibility that human activities releasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere could change the global climate for more than a century. Second, this is a field really populated with real talent. Quantitative estimates of the possible magnitude of climate change have been appearing regularly in the scientific literature for almost 50 years. Last year, more than 1,500 articles on the subject appeared in the peer-reviewed literature. Among the authors of these articles are some of the most distinguished scientists now engaged in any research, basic or applied, in all of Earth system studies. <clears throat> Third, organized scientific reviews and assessments to keep track of all this research have been produced regularly over the last quarter century at the rate of at least several per year. These critical reviews have become monumental affairs involving a substantial fraction of the relevant scientific community. The most, published, most recent published report on the science of climate change by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, was more than 500 pages long, involved more than 350 authors and more than 500 scientists in the peer review of the report. What is more is that this accumulating set of community-wide international science reviews, up to and including uh, those included in your briefing packet, have tended to agree on at least four central findings. First, that the increase in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases that have occurred since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution could indeed alter the energy balance of the Earth enough to cause global warming. Second, that these increases have been and will continue to be dominated by human activities, particularly fossil fuel combustion. Third, that the accumulated greenhouse gases are likely to lead to significant climate change in the 21st century. And fourth, that the amount and rate of climate change that actually occurs can be significantly modified by technical fe technically feasible changes in human emissions of the relevant gases. Those findings have been re-reached and re-verified by more different scientific bodies than you have probably seen applied to any issue you've ever heard about. Uh, they have done it over and over again. It doesn't mean we understand everything about climate change or that we agree on everything that we do understand or that what we agree on is going to in fact turn out to be true. But it does mean that the basic measurements and calculations have been checked and checked again by independent observers. It's science. It does mean that the same hypotheses have been tested over and over again from multiple perspectives with multiple funding sources. It's science. And it does mean that for at least a decade, this may be the most important and least obvious fact, for at least a decade, the incentives for the very best scientists, the paths to the golden ring or to the Nobel Prize in climate, if there were one, have clearly been incentives to disprove any of the core hypotheses that constitute our conventional wisdom on climate change. Disproving what we think after a hundred years of work and all these hundreds of reviews, disproving what is thought to be true is the way to guarantee some scientist instant recognition uh, and honor among his or her peers, rather than just adding one more brick to the edifice that we've been adding bricks to through time. Uh, that incentive has been there, and so far the rejection uh, is still waiting to be found. Uh, what stands today as the consensus of scientific understanding on global climate change science thus has withstood about as much self-interested critical scrutiny as you could imagine being brought to bear on an important topic. Now, the understanding that's emerged, like all good science, remains tentative, incomplete, and an appropriate target for skeptical dissent. But unlike most environmental science, it is something pretty solid and pretty tested on which a wise decision maker might well want to bet uh, something. Uh, that said, I will move us on to the real scientists on the panel. Um, 
The organizers of the spring exercise have assembled for us a, uh, a collection of distinguished scientists, each of whom has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of the interactions between human activities and the global environment. Uh, they are, as it were, four individuals sitting on top of the shoulders of these uh, 20 to 50 years of reports, uh, studies, and so on by others. Uh, if I just go down the string here in the order in which they'll speak, um, Dr. Mike McElroy is Professor of Environmental Studies here at Harvard and an internationally recognized authority on atmospheric chemistry and physics. Dr. Tom Wigley is Senior Scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He's author of the Pew Center Report on the Science of Climate Change, which is in your packet, uh, and he's a frequent, been a frequent contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Jim McCarthy is Professor of Biological Oceanography here at Harvard, currently co-chair of the IPCC's Working Group 2, looking at issues of climate vulnerability and impacts. And finally, John Holdren on the end is Professor of Environmental Policy, also here at Harvard, currently chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technologies panel on climate, uh, sorry, panel on energy research and development. Now, each of these gentlemen has at various times in the last year provided briefings covering the whole breadth of climate science issues that are before us today. Uh, I have at least encouraged them not to try to make that entire briefing on everything in their five minutes. Uh, and in their opening remarks, we've at least arranged the flow uh, to go from beginning on what we know of some of the basic science of what might cause the climate to change and how much has it changed, how might it change in the future at this end, uh, down towards impacts and vulnerability on that end and the technical options for changing the situation uh, as we finish up with John Holdren. The ground rules are that each of them will start with a uh, short, five-minute, uninterrupted presentation of their core points. We'll go just straight down the list doing that. We'll then come back and go back down the list with two minutes of rebuttal or expansion on some of the issues that came up. Uh, then that will bring us half an hour into the proceedings. And for the remaining 45 to 50 minutes of our session, it will be open to uh, question and answer from the floor. Thank you, and we'll be able to begin with uh, Mike McElroy. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. What, what I thought I would do in uh, five minutes is to, first of all, very briefly say what this uh, problem is. What is the greenhouse effect? Then I'm going to give you a little look at uh, the changes in climate that have taken place in the last 150 years. Then I'm going to talk about uh, models, and I'm going to talk about one specific large model that's been used to study both past climate and also to project uh, future climate. And that's the model from the Hadley Center at the British uh, Met Office. Um, the greenhouse effect is, is, is not particularly complicated. Um, it's, it's like putting insulation on your house. If you add insulation to your house and burn oil at a constant rate, the house gets warmer the more insulation you put on. The greenhouse agent in, 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 of issue here is, uh, is carbon dioxide and some other greenhouse gases, but the real insulating agent on the Earth is probably not the direct uh, greenhouse gases that we add, but the secondary effect that comes from water vapor. So it's a complicated problem, and one of the complications is that you must not only be able to describe the greenhouse gas that you put in and how long it stays there, but also what it does to the water cycle in the atmosphere, in particular what it does to the abundance of water vapor in upper regions of the lower atmosphere of the Earth. Now, there's been a tendency over the last uh, number of years for a lot of the political discussion or a lot of the, the question of impact to have focused on the global average temperature change. And many people look at, uh, at, uh, at, at how the global average temperature has changed since 1860 over a period for which we have fairly good uh, uh, measurements and compare models with, uh, with these uh, data. And this is a, a summary of the observations showing that from 1860 to about 1910 or so, there's not a heck of a lot of change in the global average temperature of the Earth. Then it pops up by about uh, 0.4 degrees or so between 1910 roughly and 1940. And again, it sort of settles down into a more or less constant uh, flat uh, level. And beginning in about in the late 1970s, early 1980s, for the last two decades, it's been uh, pushing up. And it's gone up by a little more than the rise that occurred between 1910 and 1940. 19, um, so now, how do we... Um, 
uh, try to model uh, this, uh, how, how do models uh, for the climate system agree with what you actually observe? The modeling the climate system is an enormously complex task. And it has to be said that none of these models are perfect in terms of, uh, of models that can be really used to give you a weather forecast for the next century. Uh, very briefly to talk about the complexities. If you want to describe the climate system with a big computer model, you must describe how the atmosphere moves. You must describe how the atmosphere forces the ocean to move. You must describe how the ocean responds back and affects the atmosphere. You must be able to describe how the biosphere changes because the hydrological cycle is involved. You must be able to describe sea ice. In, in, in short, you have to have a comprehensive model for the entire surface of the Earth. And that is simply an enormously complex task, even for the biggest computers today. And all models, all models resort to subjective uh, approximations that are required to describe some of these uh, processes. Now, uh, one test that you can apply to models is, do they reproduce what you observe? And the traditional thing has been to look at how the models do with global average temperature. In some sense, that's not what we really care about. We care about what the model is going to do in terms of predicting the climate change in regions where people live. Uh, this is a, the, the, uh, the Hadley Center model. Other people get more or less similar results. The, the red curve here, or the green curve, is what the model projects the temperature should uh, do going back to 1860 if, it's, if the atmosphere is responding only to the increase in greenhouse gases. And in one of the early IPCC reports, people were a little concerned that in fact the model was predicting more temperature increase than was observed. So what do they do? They went back and they said, well, let's find something else. And in particular, they recognized that uh, and when we burn fossil fuel, we not only produce CO2, but we also produce sulfur oxides, and sulfur oxides can make sulfate aerosols. And so the model attempted to take care of sulfate aerosols, reducing sulfate aerosols reflect sunlight, offsetting the greenhouse effect. Temperature comes down, and now you begin to see something that looks more or less in better agreement with observation. Serious question is whether the model really does this in, um, in a more detailed sense if you look at what the temperature changes are in particular regions. However, this is as good a model as there is, and I want to just finish by talking a little bit about what that particular model says about global, the global distribution of the changes in temperature that might occur over the next uh, century. The model predicts very impressive warming over a large part of the Earth. It predicts, in particular, very significant warming at high latitudes in winter. It predicts that uh, Arctic sea ice is going to basically recede so that perhaps maritime passages from in the Northwest Passage may even be open. It predicts, most surprisingly, major drying out of the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest, this model effectively disappears in 20, 2050. It predicts major drying of central regions of Africa. It predicts that over large parts of North America, snow in winter is replaced by precipitation and the, the ecological changes associated with that are extreme, and perhaps we can get into those a little later. Um, thank you very much. Five minutes moves fast. <laughs> um, they've said you can use a pointer if you want it. Pointer, yes. apparently. Okay. Pass the view pass down. Oops, we need to pass the... It's half of mine was logistics. Okay, I'm just going to move on uh, from the previous uh, presentation and uh, a little bit of overlap for continuity. I want to say a little bit about the past and something about the future and then something about what we can do uh, in order to change the future. Uh, this diagram is this basically the same data uh, of the observed global temperature record and those are the dots that you can see in different ways of trying to explain that uh, and I've included another factor here beyond what you saw in the previous uh, transparency. Okay, so the observed data are the dots, and the, the top curve is when we force a model just with greenhouse gases, that's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, halocarbons, and so on. Uh, then when we add the emissions of sulfur dioxide that produce these uh, reflective aerosols of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, a net cooling effect, if we do that um, without any tuning or faking or anything like that, then what happens is that the model actually predicts less warming than is observed. The important factor is that over the last hundred years and for all time, climate change is 
caused not just by human activities, but also by the interplay between natural processes and human activities. And so the third curve includes uh, an estimate of what the effects of solar output changes, the in energy output from the sun, has done to global warming temperatures over the last 100 years. And when we put those three things together, basically anthropogenic forcing from different sources plus solar variability, that's when we get a reasonably good fit with the observations. So it's important to consider consider natural processes as well, and that's what we do. We try, as scientists, to include all of the factors that we think might affect the climate system. Okay, so um, what about the future? Uh, in order to estimate the future, we can't predict what natural processes are going to occur, so we just isolate out the so-called anthropogenic effects, and uh, in order to determine uh, what human influences might be on future climate. We need to know something about human activities, how much energy is going to be used, what the gross national products are going to do in different countries, uh, and all the factors that determine the emissions in future of the various gases that can change the radiative balance of the Earth atmosphere system. This diagram, uh, which is in that Pew report that's been mentioned, shows from 1990 to 2100 estimated changes in global mean temperature, and uh, there's a range of uncertainties involved here. Uncertainties are caused by uncertainties in human behavior, emissions of greenhouse gases, and uncertainties in how the climate system might respond to changes in atmospheric composition. And that that allows us to estimate that global mean warming over the next 100 years or so might be a little more than one degree, which is about twice what has occurred in the last 100 years. So that's an acceleration in the rate of warming, up to as much as about four degrees warming, which would be a massive acceleration in the rate of warming and something that we should be very, very concerned about. So what should we do? Uh, we have guidelines uh, in the Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, which has as one of its ultimate objectives, uh, the goal to stabilize the atmospheric composition. And in other words, if we stabilize the levels of carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere, then hopefully we will stabilize the climate system. And the guidelines say that we should do that in a way that uh, is not going to cause dangerous interference with the climate system, and also in a way that's not going to be economically disruptive. Okay, so uh, one way to do uh, at least part of that job is to try to change the emissions of greenhouse gases so that the composition of carbon, the concentration of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and so on stays, uh, reaches some stable level in the atmosphere. And these are um, some pathways into the future. They're hypothetical pathways and they allow us to figure out what um, we need to do in order to stabilize the climate system. Okay. Um, the, the colored curves show stabilizing atmospheric composition of CO2 at 550 parts per million, about double the pre-industrial level, and at 750 parts per million, about three times the pre-industrial level. The dark curve is a business-as-usual trajectory. That's a tra trajectory for CO2 concentration that uh, would arise if we didn't do anything uh, in order to try and uh, reduce the rate of future climate change. Okay, so how do we follow these other pathways? Well, clearly we need to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide in the future. Um, stabilizing concentration does not mean stabilizing emissions. And I'll show you as my last transparency uh, what is the requirement. If I can get it out. For emissions of carbon dioxide. Okay, so the black curve is an emissions profile under a business as usual assumption, a no policy assumption. And you can see that to follow any of the colored curves, if you look at the blue one, which stabilizes CO2 at 550 parts per million, we have to reduce emissions enormously in the future below what a business as usual trajectory might be. And I can come back to this diagram later. So the task is an enormous task. Um, Instead of 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions in the year 2100, we have to have emissions that are around about present day levels between six and eight gigatons of carbon. Thank you, Tom. I tell you, the reason for running us through at this uh, alarming rate is so that you get a feel of the kinds of issues that these folks have on their minds, and then we turn it back to you instead of us to decide which of those you want to spend most of the Q&A time on. Uh, Jim McCarthy. Thank you, Bill. 
Uh, my task today is to, um, to give you a, a status report on the project Bill referred to when he introduced me, which is what is called Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, known as IPCC. The IPCC process is the one Bill was alluding to when he mentioned the, the uh, consensus statements that are so often cited in the press, uh, the, the thousand scientists uh, concur sort of statements. And the IPCC process uh, first ran its exercise in the late 80s, produced a report in about 1990. It ran its second uh, cycle in, in uh, the early 90s, produced a report in 1995, 1996. And we're now in what is called the third assessment, and our report will be produced uh, very early in um, a calendar year 2001. Uh, the, 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 the IPCC process is divided into three working groups. Uh, the first deals with what you might call the science of climate change. It, it will have the, the sort of information that, that Mike and Tom were just discussing, the latest findings, and assess uh, the, the robust quality of, uh, of the new understanding since the last assessment. The Working Group 2, which I co-chair with Osvaldo Canziani from Argentina, uh, you might think of as the so what question. Our challenge is to look at impacts, adaptive strategies, and assess vulnerabilities. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then Working Group 3 uh, focuses on mitigation strategies. You might think of it as, well, what do, what, what do we do uh, given this information? Uh, our particular working group uh, involves about 180 authors from 70 countries. We have focused on a set of what we consider to be the key sectors and systems, such as water. We saw this family of scenarios that uh, Tom Wigley just shown. Within that family of scenarios, there, are, uh, there is a range of, of implications for where the water will be. Will areas be wetter or will they be drier? If the amount of water they receive is similar to what they have now, will it come perhaps more episodically? Also looking at natural and managed ecosystems, and in this latter uh, aspect of that, the managed ecosystems, we have the subject of agriculture, which is, again, not unrelated uh, to the distribution of water. Another chapter looks at coastal and marine ecosystems, particularly here in the context of sea level rise. Um, another um, looks at, at, uh, at energy, industry, and, and human settlements. Another at financial services, and one, finally, human health. Then, by compiling uh, the latest information in each of these categories, we do a cross-cut across eight regions. Uh, there are basically continental regions like Africa and Asia, but also some that, deserve, that require special consideration like the small island states. And if you think of any of these changes that, that one would deduce from changes in climate, temperature, uh, precipitation, and the implications of those for, for example, agriculture or for human health, you can see that as one would go region to region, uh, you would have a potential range of different responses. And these scenarios that, that uh, we're working with, what we saw were the global, uh, the global averages for those, uh, they have regional manifestations as well. Now this is one of the trickiest parts, that is deducing from a scenario for, for climate change in the future, which would be based upon the scenarios for uh, for emissions, uh, how those might be manifested regionally. And basically what we've tried to do in each region is to, to identify what we would call the system exposure uh, to climate change. How, how exposed is a particular natural or human system to, to climate change uh, stimuli? And this would include both the direct and indirect effects of climate change. An indirect effect, for example, would be like sea level rise. We then attempted to categorize uh, the sensitivity of, of that particular uh, sector or system uh, to climate change. And, and we have to be mindful of the possibility that this sensitivity could result in, in a benefit, uh, not simply a, a, uh, an adverse effect of climate change. For example, warming in some regions could lead to a promotion of agriculture. Next, um, we have uh, attempted to address, uh, address the adaptive capacity of individual regions with regard to these particular sectors or systems. And here we make a distinction between adaptive capacity and adaptive potential. That is to say that there is the potential of a region to, to uh, perhaps supply all the food for the people in the region. It's not the same to say that that region has the capacity. And how might the capacity change uh, under an altered climate system?
And then finally, uh, we have attempted to draw from uh, the exposure, the sensitivity, minus the adaptive capacity, an underlying estimate of vulnerability. Uh, to the degree that, that we think of all these systems and sectors as being vulnerable to climate today, the question we then ask is, will they be more or less vulnerable to the sort of climate change uh, that one could prognosticate from these climate change models? Thank you. Thank you, John. John Holdren. Okay, I'm going to talk about the uh, options for addressing uh, the task of ameliorating the risks of climate change, but from the standpoint of the science and technology mainly, and not the economics and politics, I'll, you'll have other sessions that will cover that, and I may sneak into it a teeny weeny bit at the end. If we return to a question that Dr. Wigley addressed briefly, the relative contributions of different phenomena to the climate changes that we are experiencing. The transparency that's up here now, based on the second assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, breaks down the effects uh, up until 1995 from pre-industrial times uh, in terms of the contributions of carbon dioxide, that's in the turquoise, the contributions of other greenhouse gases, namely uh, methane, nitrous oxide, uh, chlorofluorocarbons uh, and the like, and the contributions below the line, the negative contributions of atmospheric aerosols, which are also mentioned, and the diagonal slopes represent the uncertainties in those magnitudes. The bar over on the far right indicates uh, what would be expected under business as usual out to the year 2100 in terms of these magnitudes. And over here on the left is the magnitude of the solar variation as estimated up to 1995. Now the burden of this transparency is that the overwhelmingly important and increasingly important contribution to this forcing out to the year 2100 will be the carbon dioxide. That is not to say that the other gases are unimportant, but carbon dioxide is by far the most important one, becoming more so relatively speaking, every day, and for reasons that will now become clear, is extremely difficult to deal with. The source of most of this carbon dioxide is the combustion of fossil fuel. This transparency shows the history of world primary energy supply from 1850 to 1997. The green on the bottom is biomass fuels, that is fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, still the mainstay of energy supply for the two billion poorest people in the world. On top of that, blue hydropower, red nuclear, and then the vast bulk of the growth from the middle of the 19th century up until the end of the century that we just finished, the vast bulk of that growth is the expansion of fossil fuel use, coal in brown, oil in gray, natural gas in yellow, which increased in the range of 100-fold over this period. There is, you won't be surprised to know, a large disparity in who is emitting this carbon dioxide between the industrialized nations where the per capita emissions are very high, see those at the top, United States, Australia, Canada, and so on down the list, Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union in the middle, the developing countries uh, down at the bottom, with an average per capita emission in the range of one-tenth, the average per capita emission in the industrial nations. All of that by way of a snapshot of where we are and how we got there. If you then look at where we're going, the business as usual energy future, there are many variants of the business as usual energy future. This is mine, uh, very similar to the IPCC's business as usual uh, scenario from the uh, 1995 assessment, a little higher on population, a little different in other factors, but roughly the same. Business as usual, by the way, doesn't mean that nothing changes. It means that things continue to change in about the pattern they have recently been doing. So under business as usual, population growth rates continue to fall, as they have recently been doing. Uh, energy intensity of economic activity continues to fall. Carbon intensity of energy supply continues to fall, but at about the historical rates. And where one ends up is with a rough uh, quadrupling of 
carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the uh, 110 years between the 1990 baseline and 2100. One ends up with a five-folding in uh, energy supply and so on. Uh, Bill Clark is telling me I'm running out of time, so I'll skip a few transparencies and go faster. <laughs> <laughs> what could we do about this? What are the options for corrective action? There are basically four classes of possible approaches. You can try to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. You can try to remove greenhouse gases that have already been added to the atmosphere. The most obvious way to do that is growing trees, increasing the standing crop of biomass, but there are some other ways under investigation that it might be done. A third strategy is to try to counteract the climatic effects of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is sometimes called geotechnical engineering, for example, uh, injecting reflective particles. Uh, into orbit would be an example of a way to do this. And finally, one can adapt to greenhouse gas-induced climate change. In fact, we will end up doing a mixture of all of these things, at least emission reductions, removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, at least by growing trees, and adaptation, which to some extent we're already doing. Whether we undertake any geotechnical engineering really remains to be seen. Uh, the reduction of emissions is going to be uh, an immense challenge. It's going to have to bear a large part of this burden. Bill Clark is giving me dirty looks. Let me just uh, indicate what the determinants of emissions are. It's a very simple arithmetic relation. Population times GDP per person times the amount of energy it takes to make a unit of GDP times the amount of carbon it takes to make a unit of energy. We can deal with all those variables. We know quite a lot about it. The uh, topic which I've run out of time to discuss, but we'll find a way to sneak back to in the Q&A, is what the energy options are that are available to uh, address this task. This, this is Holdren telling you what question he hopes you will ask him in the Q&A. <laughs> what better energy options we need divided into two categories, those that are certainly attainable with effort and those that are worth pursuing, even though it's not clear whether we will succeed. Anyone taking his course next term can sort of get a head start by coming back with some of those. Um, okay, uh, following the plan laid down by the powers that be, uh, what we're going to do is now quickly go back down the row uh, and give the speakers an opportunity uh, to either uh, elaborate on the few things they may not have been able to say in the first five minutes uh, or to take issue with, uh, amplify, or uh, whatever on comments made by some of their colleagues up here. Uh, so I'll keep the same sequence. Mike? Well, let me just say a, a few words about um, the the type of changes that potentially could occur on the local level, the changes that you really have to be concerned about. And again, taking the cue from this particular uh, model that I showed a little bit of results from, the Hadley Center model, that model and most models, in fact, predict that with higher concentrations of greenhouse gases, there will be significant warming, particularly in winter, at the higher latitudes. So let's just consider the implications of a transition from snow in winter to in the interior of continents to rain. And think about how serious and potentially serious that particular transition, modest as it might be, could, could be for lots of things. If you don't have any snow, uh, you know, when it rains, the water runs off, and it runs off very quickly. The soil gets colder, it freezes more readily. If it freezes, the water runs off even more. So you lose the ability to recharge aquifers by not having snow melting in those aquifers. You also lose the nice, slow, steady supply of, of, uh, of water to streams and to, uh, and to rivers. You know, an apparently beneficial effect has some negative downsides. Let me finally briefly comment on uh, the other feature of that model that really got my attention. The model as I mentioned briefly, projects that there will be enormous decreases in precipitation over the Amazon basin and over portions of Central Africa, balanced by an increase in precipitation over Indonesia. Now, 
you can worry about whether the model is right in this level of detail, but it has to be said that that is a potentially surprising but yet physically conceivable interpretation of what might happen. Were that to happen, this uh, decrease in rainfall over the, over the Amazon basin, in the model, you then lose the cooling of uh, due to evaporative uh, effects from uh, water in the soil. So the rainforest disappears and is replaced by, by savanna in that particular model with a large increase in the emission of CO2 due to the decomposition of the material. So they, the problem is complex, and uh, the challenge of trying to simulate all of the details is, uh, is still one that we're not quite there in, in terms of doing. Thank you. Tom? Um, I'd just like to say something about uh, a very simple view of uh, policy determinants. And uh, the way you can look at this picture, and this is really a, an oversimplified view, but it's a good starting point. You can say, uh, how much warming do you think we can tolerate? You know, clearly, if the world warmed by 10 degrees Celsius or 20 degrees Celsius relative to now, I don't think that we, we would survive. And if the warming were only another half a degree, which is what has occurred over the last 100 years, then I don't think we'd have to worry too much. So somewhere in the middle there is some target for warming that we think is a tolerable target. So then you can take the next step backwards and say, well, what atmospheric composition requirement would reach that target would, and not exceed that target? What level of carbon dioxide uh, would be an upper bound that we could tolerate in terms of the implied climate change? And you have to consider not just carbon dioxide, but also other greenhouse gases as well. We have a concept called equivalent carbon dioxide that allows us to do that, so that uh, we have to consider these other greenhouse gases too, and what we can do about stabilizing their levels in the atmosphere. And then you can go back one other step and say, well, if we have a certain tolerable target for atmospheric CO2 or equivalent CO2 level, what emissions are required in order to, or what is the upper bound for emissions required in order to uh, stay below that, that threshold, that upper bound in, uh, for composition. Uh, and then you, and then you can say, well, uh, what are the capabilities for reducing emissions below a business as usual um, a projection you know, in terms of uh, policy responses? You know, what sort of policies are necessary? What sort of technology development is necessary to reach those uh, emissions targets? Um, and then you can ask more sophisticated questions like, how rapidly can we afford to do this? You know, if we, if we rapidly or too rapidly reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide, then that could be disruptive on the economy. So you have to look at a timing issue as well. Uh, and somehow balance uh, both uh, the, the, the costs of reducing uh, emissions, uh, the costs of um, adapting to climate change uh, against particular targets that we think uh, may be intolerable. Thank you. Jim? John mentioned uh, adaptation and said, uh, indeed, we're uh, doing some of, that, some of that now. We certainly are. Um, it doesn't matter uh, where you look, which continent, you would find uh, evidence of that in response to, um, to unusual uh, weather in the last uh, handful of years, the last decade. Uh, we've seen, perhaps, uh, you noticed in the newspaper earlier this week that, that uh, this is the, the warmest winter, December, January, February, uh, for the continental U.S. of A., uh, which is uh, the previous record was a year ago, and the record before that was a year before that. Um, indeed, you would look about and see that there is adaptation underway now in, uh, in many of our economic sectors uh, that um, would, would uh, in fact, plan differently for next winter uh, than they might have planned for uh, the forthcoming winter five or ten years ago. And, and when one thinks about uh, Tom's point about uh, sort of tolerable targets for greenhouse gases, we, we need also to uh, be mindful of the fact that, um, that the changes that occur may not be uh, uh, smooth and regular, but they, uh, they may be uh, disruptive and discontinuous. And if one looks at uh, particularly uh, some of the precipitation events in the last couple of years, uh, in November uh, 1998 in Honduras, uh, in December uh, 1999 in Venezuela, in February, March uh, 2000 in uh, Mozambique, uh, we can see uh, that indeed um, uh, the, the potential to adapt, the potential uh, to respond uh, with everything from human life, livelihood, um, agriculture, uh, and, and certainly we're seeing in each of these cases uh, uh, serious implications of human disease is something that we're not very well prepared for. And one of the great juggernauts as we look to uh, the future and think of adaptive uh, responses is, is uh, to what degree, particularly some of these, these large climate cycles we've become 
pretty familiar with, for example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, will behave in the future like they have in the past, or perhaps in the last two decades where we've seen the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, take on different forms. We've seen uh, in 1982, the El Nino of the century, eclipsed in 1997, 98 by yet another El Nino of the century. Uh, we have seen unusual behavior in what had for a long time thought to have been rather rhythmic patterns. So part of the, uh, part of the, uh, of the, of the difficulty in, um, in, in uh, uh, looking to the future is, 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 uh, is that of, of not only climate change, but how, how much different the pattern might be, how much more variable might climate be than it is today. Thank you. John? I'm going to resist the temptation to uh, show the transparencies that I didn't finish before <laughs> and instead uh, make a different point, which is uh, why I think people still tend to underrate the magnitude of the challenge that the world faces in the interaction of the climate future and the energy future. I think there are basically six reasons that people tend to underrate this complex of issues. The first is that human well-being is more dependent both on energy and on the climate than most people think. The second reason is that existing energy sources are more problematic and climate change is further along than most people think. Problematic in the sense that 75% of the world's energy and 85% of that of the United States still come from fossil fuels emitting all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The third reason is that the energy and climate implications of the expected amounts of growth over the next century, both in population and in economic activity per person, are bigger than most people think. Most people just haven't run out the numbers to see what business as usual means, that we're looking in the year 2100 under business as usual at a $400 trillion world economy using perhaps four times as much energy and emitting roughly four times as much carbon dioxide as today. Fourth point is that scientific uncertainties, although they are considerable in this matter, are not proper grounds for complacency, as many people tend to think. Many people think uncertainty means that when we learn more, we'll know it's not as bad as we feared. And in fact, that's not how it is. Uncertainty cuts in both directions. It could be better than the middle of the road projections, but it could also be worse for some of the reasons that Jim McCarthy was just uh, mentioning. Fifth, the time lags in the appearance of symptoms, the diagnosis of the cause, the prescription of a remedy, and the actual implementation of the remedy are longer than most people think. It takes longer to steer and turn around this super tanker than most people suppose. And finally, the fate of industrialized countries and less developed countries are more interconnected than most people think. Some people say, well, the most vulnerable countries are those in the South. They are more directly impacted by climatic effects on forests, on fisheries, on agriculture. They have less capital to adjust and so on and so forth. And some people in the North have the temerity to say, well, we're okay even if they're not. But the fact is our fates are linked by flows of people, of ideas, of images, of money, of drugs, of diseases, of weapons, of bombs. Uh, there really is no way the fate of the South can be separated from the fate of the North, even if you misguidedly wanted to do that. We are all in this pickle together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to the panel for their initial remarks. Uh, we now have uh, about 30 minutes of open question and answer. Um, I will try to keep the questions on that side, the answers on this side. Uh, in interest of exploiting our guests as much as we can, I will discourage long speeches. Uh, I'll save the last five minutes uh, for just to pass back down the panel for last comments or summings up. So at that, the floor is open. One here. Uh, stand up, give your name. Um, yeah, we'll do that. Um, uh, we're going to. What I'm going to do is take questions to the front, and we will decide which route to go. Um, John or Tom, you want to pick a lead on that? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take an initial shot. It's a very big question, one I should be grateful for. Uh, yes. the, the, the question is, where are we in the 
technological development of energy options that would be able to address uh, this particular question. And uh, like many such situations, this is a glass that is both half empty and half full. You can look at it optimistically or pessimistically. Optimistically, there's been a tremendous amount of progress over the last uh, 25 years and more on the technology of improving energy efficiency, on the technology of non-carbon emitting energy sources, particularly renewable, but also uh, some progress on nuclear energy sources. And more recently, there's been very important progress in starting to understand how one could continue to use fossil fuels but capture and sequester away from the atmosphere some substantial part of the carbon that ordinarily would be emitted when one burns those fuels. There are still very substantial uncertainties about exactly how much that will cost, but it looks more interesting today than it did even a few years ago. These are the respects in which the glass is half full. The respects in which it's half empty are, number one, that we have a long way to go before we have in hand an array of energy options which would enable us to drastically reduce carbon emissions without substantial increases in costs and therefore substantial economic impacts. And number two, we are not spending nearly as much money on energy research, development, demonstration, and accelerated deployment as the challenge and the opportunities require. Thank you. Okay. Here. Uh, we seem to be using forum style, so the two microphones are there and people are welcome to stake out turf. Um, I can't remember who put Your up the name? graph. Susan Misra, and um, some, one of you put up a graph that had the relative contributions to the climate change, specifically showing that the greenhouse gases, the CO2 and the aerosols would be a large portion of it. And I was just wondering, because on both sides it seemed even if we did reduce the emissions, there'd still be a very large increase in the number, amount of greenhouse gases, CO2 and aerosols. So. Um, I'm not sure why is there such a huge focus on reducing emissions if it's either way, it's, we're still going to have a large amount in the future? That's my interpretation of the graph. Well, that's probably Tom. <laughs> well, it wasn't, my, it wasn't my graph, but... It, uh, it wasn't my graph. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you, you raise a very important point, and that is no matter what we do, we're uh, going to experience, uh, I believe, unprecedented changes in climate. Uh, so, but the point is that um, unless we do something then, and in a timely fashion, then the future changes in climate will be even greater. We really need to reduce the magnitude of future change. We can't just let the system go on because if we did, uh, just to give you one example, um, sea level is and almost an inexorable force uh, in terms of uh, what can happen in the future. If we follow a business as usual pathway to the end of this century and beyond, then sea level will continue to rise at roughly, say, 50 centimeters per century for thousands of years. And at some point, the world would get sufficiently warm that the large ice masses in Antarctica would rapidly move into the ocean and, and just accelerate sea level rise. So there are, on a century plus time scale, there are things that we really do not want to happen. That doesn't mean that we can stabilize climate at the present level, but we have to do everything we can to reduce the magnitude of future, future climate change. John? quick addendum to this answer with another transparency. These are results of runs of the geophysical fluid dynamics climate simulation model at Princeton. The top one, temperature increases for a doubled CO2 world, and the bottom one, a quadrupled CO2 world. Under business as usual, we're heading rather rapidly by the end of this century toward a commitment toward a quadrupling. The doubling is in the area that many people think is the right answer to Tom Wigley's question, what is a level we ought to try to stay below to minimize the chance of really disruptive changes? The scale here is in degrees Fahrenheit when the dark brown is 25, the orange is 15, the green to yellow are in the range of 5 to 10. You see there's an immense difference between those two worlds in terms of how much 
one has warmed the climate overall. Very much worth trying for this one or better rather than resigning ourselves to not being able to do much and ending up in this one. Uh, my name is Frank Mitchke. I was wondering if uh, Professor McCarthy, when you identified the recent uh, tragedies in Venezuela and Honduras, et cetera, if though you attribute those directly or almost directly, as directly as you can, to global climate change, and um, if they vary significantly from what we've seen in the past in different hot spots that had similar tragedies, if we're seeing more of these tragedies in general, and if uh, so, what we might expect to see in the future, um, if, if this is a trend. Do I need to repeat the question? Uh, no, I think we're on mics now. Uh, attribution is, uh, is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, what we can say uh, with regard to uh, the climate anomalies of the 1990s is that if you were to look at the first IPCC, Working Group 1 report on the science of climate change, and look down the list of the, uh, the eight or dozen or so uh, specific expectations of how the climate would change in the future and map that with what has been observed in this decade, uh, you'll find that, in a sense, there aren't any surprises. And one of those, one of those um, statements is that as, as the climate warms, uh, there will be more moisture in the atmosphere. You evaporate more water from the, from the ocean. You energize the atmosphere and the likelihood of, of uh, more intense precipitation events unfolds. Uh, similarly, you will see that as uh, the atmosphere warms, uh, you would uh, expect to be losing, um, losing ice, both in, in uh, alpine glaciers and also sea ice. Alpine glaciers are receding on every continent. Uh, sea ice, we now know as of uh, the last year or so with, with uh, the release of information from the 1950s, classified information that everywhere in the Arctic Ocean, Sea ice has thinned from the 1950s to today, and it is basically the, the, the ballpark number is that we've lost 40% of Arctic sea ice. So all of these, you could look at all these observations and say, um, are they, uh, can you attribute them directly uh, to greenhouse warming? Well, it's very tough, but if you look at what you would expect with a warmer, more energized atmosphere, uh, these are consistent. Now, uh, the fact that Honduras, uh, 1998, was uh, the most extreme precipitation event in, in uh, uh, weather history in, in Honduras, the most sustained um, uh, precipitation event, uh, would that have had uh, the effect it did had uh, the, the, uh, the region that was hit not been so altered by dense human occupation, by uh, land use change that is stripped natural vegetation? No the impact would have been far less. So, we, so in many cases, we have a combination of factors. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the recent flooding in, in Venezuela, or, or three years ago in 1998, uh, a similar uh, precipitation anomaly in, in, um, in Kenya, where they had 10 times the normal rainfall in their dry season, which destroyed virtually all the bridges, the macadam, uh, a, a massive epidemic of Rift Valley fever following that. Um, were those unprecedented in those regions? Yes. There's, there's no, no record in, in, in the last century or so of, of weather keeping of events of that sort. So uh, I think the lesson is, first of all, that um, uh, it is um, uh, likely that th th these fit the pattern of, of what is anticipated from, uh, with regard to climate change that in, in cases where uh, we can indeed uh, learn from these events and be better able to, to adapt to them, we must do everything we can. The likelihood that we can count on them being less frequent or less severe in the future is small. Hi, my name is Josiah Brown, and this is a question for any of the panelists, I guess, uh, an invitation for you to comment. And it's about the uh, disparity in temperature readings between, as I understand, the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere based on satellite measurements and on what you think the significance of that disparity might be. Dr. Wigley. <laughs> okay, uh, this was a, that's a good question and it was uh, not unanticipated. Um, to give people the back, a little bit of background, uh, since the late 1970s, we have been measuring uh, a sort of column mean temperature in the uh, middle troposphere. Um, 
using satellites uh, that give very pr precise indications of temperature change. And over the 20 year period since that record began, the, those temperatures, uh, say six kilometers above the Earth's surface roughly, uh, have not warmed uh, or have only warmed a very small amount. Whereas at the surface, the warming rate uh, has been between 0.1 uh, and 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So, you know, why has the surface warmed and uh, the upper layers of the atmosphere above the surface not warmed? Well, um, there are a lot of different explanations. And um, I'll just run through a few of them, and I'll say at the start that we don't really know the explanation for this, and, and I think it's one of the leading scientific questions uh, of today, but it doesn't, certainly doesn't invalidate uh, the climate models. Okay, firstly, you could say that one or other data sets were flawed. Uh, you could say, for example, that the surface warming is an artifact of uh, urbanization effects that contaminate the temperature readings. Uh, I think we have carefully looked at the data to, to, to rule out that possibility, but it is uh, still an explanation that's been put forward. Um, the uh, second uh, possible explanation is that the models uh, are wrong. Now, the, what the models show is that there should be roughly equal warming rates above the Earth's surface and at the Earth's surface. And, it, and in fact, uh, in some model simulations, the warming should be even greater above the Earth's surface than at the surface. Uh, so there seems to be uh, a big discrepancy between the model expectation and the observations. Now, uh, a model is only as good as what you put into it. And there are a lot of factors that control the climate. Uh, it's not just carbon dioxide buildup, but uh, another uh, factor that controls the climate, as I pointed out before, is natural variations. Uh, and for example, there have been some major volcanic eruptions over the last 20 years, and the impact of those eruptions depends on where you are in the atmosphere. They're different at the surface, they're different aloft, uh, compared with aloft. Uh, at the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, influence on climate has been mentioned, and that has a different signature in the free atmosphere above the Earth's surface compared with that the Earth's surface. And in addition, apart from anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide emissions and emissions of sulfur dioxide to produce aerosols, we've also been uh, destroying the ozone layer in the atmosphere. And um, the effect of reduced ozone in the, in the stratosphere uh, is to cause a cooling uh, below the tropopause, down to maybe five kilometers from the surface, but not to cool the surface. Okay, so when you put all these factors together and account for their uncertainties, we can't quite explain the difference, but we certainly have enough candidate explanations uh, that we can quantify rather uncertainly uh, with, you know, with, with large uncertainty bounds, but we have enough explanations on the table to be able to uh, understand why there should be a difference, but I don't think we know completely the answer. I mean, it's some, this is an area of active research. Uh, it would be trivializing a very complex problem to say, uh, as many people have done on the so-called greenhouse skeptic side, that this proves the models are wrong. That's just not quite correct. I mean, what you really have to do is you've got to drive a model with the right forcing factors, and if you don't, then it's essentially garbage in, garbage out. Thanks. Yeah, um, Tal Clement. My question is um, how all of this science fits with the current policy position of the United States and whether or not it's consistent or inconsistent. And if you could just evaluate stances that the United States has taken at the various conferences on this as it relates to all these scientific developments, because it's unclear to me. I understand, you know, that's it. <laughs> Come on, Mike. You got this one. Go on. Well, <laughs> let, 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 me, let me take a shot at, at this. Uh, f first of all, the United States is a party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was uh, agreed at Rio in 1992, signed by George Bush, ratified by the United States Senate, now the law of the land. Most people have forgotten this in the more recent debate about the Kyoto Protocols, which have not been ratified by the United States and which are not the law of the land. But in the Framework Convention on Climate Change, to which we are already party and which in fact is therefore U.S. policy, it expresses the view that Dr. Wigley quoted here, that we are committed to try to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases at levels that do not lead to uh, major disruption of the climate. 
We are committed to cooperate with other countries to this end. We identified a number of targets which we would seek to meet without any concrete commitments uh, for achieving them. We are committed to develop inventories of emissions and so on and so forth. The further U.S. policies that have been announced since that time have largely to do with increasing uh, investments in energy research and development and creating a limited array of tax incentives of various kinds, as well as some voluntary programs to try to push industries and individual consumers in the direction of choosing less greenhouse gas emitting technologies, that is, technologies that emit smaller amounts of greenhouse gases. The uh, policy of the United States uh, administration was to sign the Kyoto Protocol, which specified further targets and timetables for reductions. The Senate has indicated it will not ratify that protocol unless and until developing countries join. At Kyoto, developing countries did not agree to set specific targets and timetables, arguing that the bulk of the responsibility for the problem so far rests with the industrial nations and they must take the lead. Nobody yet has a prescription that has succeeded in narrowing that difference uh, of view between the United States Senate on the one hand and uh, developing countries who expect the industrial nations to take the lead on the other, although there are some interesting ideas about it. Um, let me just ask you, anyone on the panel to expand a little more on this. I don't want us to get off into the politics uh, part that belongs to some other panels, but the U.S. has at various times pushed a so-called comprehensive strategy for addressing uh, greenhouse gas emissions across and trading amongst different greenhouse gases. And a scientific question there is what our scientific ability would be to monitor at the country-specific level of emissions, emissions other than CO2, so in methane or nitrous oxide and so forth, uh, that might be uh, uh, acceded to under uh, that comprehensive plan. Uh, the technical question is, could we do it? Would we know if somebody were keeping a pledge that they had made in things other than CO2? Right? I think on, on uh, CO2, on, on methane and nitrous oxide, just to, to speak to them, I, I think it would be extremely difficult to do this in a, in a scientifically uh, defensible way. I mean, the, the, the recommended approach uh, under IPCC basically is to use a formula and, and a black box formula to plug in to get uh, numbers. So you go from activities to estimates of emissions. But let's take nitrous oxide. In the case of nitrous oxide, we don't actually know why the level of nitrous oxide is going up. We do know that it's not due to burning fossil fuel. That's not a, a major contributing factor. And we suspect that uh, waste disposal and fertilizer, uh, nitrogen fertilizer applications are major contrib contributors. But in fact, we don't really know. And we have also major gaps in our understanding of methane. Um, yes, hello. My name is Alex Skinner. I have a particular question about um, China and India. I don't know how much you know about the actual work we have to do, but part of it is to um, assess what the policy response of China and India be, would be to this convention. And uh, I was wondering whether you could discuss what the uh, possible effects of global warming would be specifically on China and India themselves as a kind of a question on just the health impacts and the climatic impacts and maybe the ecological impacts. And then in the second part of that, um, what options there are available for those two countries to trade off uh, development um, and uh, the environment? Mike, why don't you lead on that, and then I'll pass it down the table. Question. Well, I think this this is really this is really a critical uh, a, a critical question. You're right. And, yeah. um, <laughs> For us, it certainly is. And, notes, yeah. and, and and I look forward to your answer. But <laughs> <laughs> let me just say that um, in terms of the the effects on uh, on on India, let's let's pick India. Most uh, you know, India, uh, precipitation is associated with the with the monsoon, obviously, and the monsoon is driven by uh, differential heating of the continent, the Asian continent versus the ocean. So you have an outflow in winter and an inflow of air in summer. Most models, uh, most GCMs that have been applied to this problem, specifically looking at the greenhouse gas issue have a tendency to 
have the monsoonal circulation not change terribly much between what it is today. But since the ocean is warmer, there's a tendency for more precipitation to be carried on to the landmass. Uh, and you know, that's a statement that is not entirely clear that it's really true, but the models, at least, the general result from the models is, is that that would have happened. I want to introduce a serious caveat. Uh, serious caveat is that all of these models are, to a greater or lesser extent, being tuned to try to give acceptable results based on what is observed. And it's an interesting fact that the models are focused on greenhouse gases, and they focused on sulfate aerosols to get a little bit of cooling, and now uh, solar activity. But the largest change that you see in the vicinity of the Indian uh, subcontinent these days is a change in terms of a very large pall of absorptive aerosols that are all over the, uh, the, the ocean region in that, uh, in, that, in that vicinity. And these are, these are soot particles, the net effect of which is to absorb sunlight, not to reflect it. And they're not included in any of these models. My guess is that if you allow for soot particles, in fact, you will reduce the strength of the monsoonal circulation by reducing the differential heating of land and sea and that could have quite serious implications for India and indeed also for, for China. Others want to rise to that? Jim? Can I, I, I don't. Let me just make a comment uh, because uh, this, this relates to uh, Congress's position uh, with regard to uh, ratification uh, of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and I think it's a, this is a very I interesting issue. Um, if, if there were a global trading scheme, uh, which of course would only be possible if developing countries uh, came on board uh, in, in the near future, then um, one of the possible effects, depending on what targets are specified for different countries, uh, would be a transfer of wealth from the developed to the developing countries. And it's possible to argue economically, um, and, and one, of the, one of the background pieces of this argument is the fact that uh, energy production is much less efficient in developing countries, and so there ought to be scope for, uh, for increasing the efficiency of, of energy production. Um, and, and given that uh, that could be done in an economically uh, more efficient way in those countries, then they would have trading power for emissions reduction rights with countries like the United States. And the net effect of that could be a transfer of wealth between us and them, in a sense. So that you could argue that there is actually something to be gained by developing countries uh, in coming on board uh, voluntarily as part of a global agreement, not just a, an agreement that is uh, perhaps going to be signed by so-called Annex One countries. You know, so there are some very interesting economic uh, aspects of this question about you know, what's, what is the role of or what is the future hold for China and India. Hi, I'm Marcela Escobar. I had a quick question on what your opinion is on the actual target climate change that you think uh, we can bear and whether that's different in different countries, i.e. a 0.5% increase in the world could have devastating effects in Brazil or India, and whether that plays a part in the urgency of timeless timelines that each country has. Let, let me leap into this silence by, by emphasizing a point that I made at the end of my follow-on remarks before, and, and that is that in my view, it's not exactly the right way to think about it to say, well, country X can stand a bigger climate change than country Y, therefore that country should lobby in the world community for this higher target. Uh, it's a little bit like the question of protecting public health. We are obliged for a variety of reasons to look at the predicament of the most sensitive subpopulations and to try to proceed in a manner that protects their interests. Uh, we don't know at this moment enough about the evolution of climate and the evolution of the pattern of impacts to be sure who's most at risk, who will be uh, damaged the most by climate change uh, of any given global average surface temperature increase characterization. 
but it seems to me that it's a sound policy to try to stay below levels of global climate disruption that greatly imperil any part of the world's population. Thank you. Here. We have five minutes of question left. What I'll do is take each of the people now standing up and then turn to the panelists for last remarks. But go on. Zen Sorry, Zania Dormandy. Um, we see that aerosols mitigate the effects of the greenhouse gases. Um, I'm sure they have some negative effects of their own, but are there any policies or are there any systems in place, mechanisms in place by which they could be used to mitigate the greenhouse gases effect? Are they, are they too negative in their own right? Um, you know, this is a question uh, that we could all um, speculate on. Uh, okay, first of all, um, I just want to tell you something about the latest uh, so-called business as usual scenarios that have been produced under the auspices of IPCC. Uh, a set of scenarios produced in the early 1990s, and in those scenarios, the emissions of sulfur dioxide uh, rose uh, by large amounts over the next 100 years. Um, now, at the time, it was realized that uh, those emissions were probably too high because people respond to the pollution aspects associated with the emissions of sulfur dioxide. And those responses were not built into those business as usual scenarios. In the, in the latest uh, round um, of scenario developments, uh, where there are something like 40 or 50 different business as usual pathways that have been put forward, uh, spanning a huge range of possibilities, um, the issue of uh, responses to environmental stresses other than climate change responses is addressed in the development of these scenarios. So that means that these scenarios have much lower sulfur dioxide emissions than the earlier ones, and because sulfur dioxide emissions produce cooling sulfate aerosols, that means that there's actually uh, an additional warming component associated with, with this, the regionally um, um, motivated um, attempts to control air pollution problems and acid precipitation problems. Okay, there, now there's another part of the question that John could uh, talk about, and that is uh, in terms of the geoengineering aspect. I mean, would it be possible to uh, go down to the South Pacific, for example, and uh, have a lot of dirty power plants there with a lot of sulfur dioxide emissions, um, and those emissions would cause uh, global scale cooling that might offset the, the warming associated with uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases? So, I don't know. I mean, this is one of the, the sort of technical fixes is that, that's been put forward, and uh, you know, John might just make a comment on that and shoot the idea down. <laughs> well, my, my, my brief comment about many of the geotechnical engineering approaches <clears throat> is that we would be fiddling on a very large scale with a system that we don't yet adequately understand. It's been mentioned here by virtually every panelist that there are a wide variety of uncertainties about how this system works. And, and the notion that in that situation of very substantial ignorance, it's a good idea to try to offset one problem by fiddling on a very large scale with another aspect of the system is uh, at best difficult. Now, we might learn enough in the future to feel more comfortable with doing that, but there is a very big danger of out of the frying pan and into the fire in, 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 in at least some of these cases. A colleague of ours once did compute how many 747s full of sulfate aerosol you would have to fly and dump into the air each day to offset the uh, CO2 emissions. It was viewed that the EIA statement on that would be problematical. Hi, Erwin Cho. Um, this question is for Professor Holdren. Um, earlier you mentioned some energy options, but things like nuclear power seem much more applicable to OECD countries. What energy options, affordable energy options, do you see for developing countries, and particularly in, with respect to industrialization? Well, very quickly, first of all, the interesting thing about nuclear energy today is the only part of the world where it's really expanding is in Asia, uh, interestingly enough. It is not uh, being expanded in the OECD countries anymore, although it might be again in the future. It does have the drawback as an approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions that it's very expensive in terms of the capital investments required. And of course, there are concerns about safety, radioactive waste management, proliferation of nuclear weapons, which would all have to be uh, satisfactorily addressed before the world would welcome with open arms a very large program uh, 
to expand uh, the nuclear contribution. But there are many other options. Uh, there's a wide range of renewable options, starting with more efficient use of the biomass fuels that already supply 13 or 14 percent of the world's energy supply, much of it in the less developed countries, but in general in very uh, high polluting and inefficient ways. By taking that same raw energy supply and using it in lower polluting and more efficient ways, one could make a big contribution in those countries. It's also a big uh, potential for expanded use of natural gas, which emits about half as much carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity generated, if used in that uh, particular way, as coal does. Uh, right now, China and India both plan uh, huge expansions in their use of coal, and they're already very big coal users. Uh, some of that will happen, and we need to attend to clean coal technologies to minimize its damage. But we should also be attentive to finding ways for those countries to use more natural gas in place of some of that coal as a transition strategy to a longer-term world in which the role of renewable energy and perhaps nuclear energy would be bigger. Thank you. Last question. My name is Flora Stern. Um, my question was just, um, can you give some examples of some other geotechnical or geoengineering possibilities that have been worked on or suggested and their relative workableness? Jim, why don't you give a comment on the sequestration issue, and then anyone else who wants to on one of the more hardwired ones? Uh, they, um, the, the two that I think Bill is asking me to mention are, um, are kind of low-tech um, solutions. Uh, one, that, um, one that is being uh, sort of actively discussed, and, 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 and the, the activity around this particular topic arises from the, um, uh, the discussions in, in Kyoto. Uh, and this would be the, the enhanced sequestration of carbon uh, via uh, biomass storage. And uh, Jean had mentioned this, mentioned this earlier. Uh, it, uh, not unlike the, uh, the problem Mike was discussing a few moments ago, has a, has a serious accounting aspect to it. That is, how would you, how would you actually uh, conduct and verify an inventory when a nation uh, were to assert that um, a, a particular measure of their emissions, or let's say growth in emissions, was being offset by uh, an increased capacity to sequester uh, carbon within their own uh, national bounds by virtue of uh, biomass storage. And the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was unfortunately uh, not very precise about this. Uh, it, 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 uh, it left uh, some huge um, uh, some ambiguities in uh, in what what might or might not be permitted, and uh, there's a, um, uh, a special report being prepared on this now. It will be presented uh, to to governments in plenary in, in about a, uh, over a month and a half time. Uh, so that that's one sort of low tech solution. Another has to do with uh, something that keeps cropping up in in uh, sort of popular articles, but indeed there are even industrial concerns uh, that have taken a stake in this, and that would be something that, that is uh, dear to my heart, um, that is any, any proposal to do such a thing, which is to um, attempt to fertilize large areas of the ocean to stimulate uh, production, particularly nutrient-poor uh, regions, and the expectation being that if you could stimulate a production of uh, photosynthetic organisms, the plankton in the ocean, uh, this would have an effect rather like that of uh, trees on land. Uh, there are big questions as to whether uh, it, it would be possible, feasible really, to stimulate large areas. And then there's a massive question as to whether it would have the desired effect. That is, whether it would lead, since we don't grow trees in the ocean, the, the, the plants are one-cell plants, whether they would, um, they would in fact, uh, ultimately, their carbon would be stored in the deep ocean for a long period of time, or whether it would be respired and go right back out. So there's very, within the ocean science community, very, very little faith that uh, that second low-tech solution has much promise. Okay. Qu quick, quick word on a, on a high-tech approach. Uh, there is a technology for burning coal already in existence called integrated gasification combined cycle, where for purposes of increasing the efficiency of electricity generation and reducing the emissions of conventional pollutants, oxides of sulfur, particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, you don't burn the coal directly, but you first gasify it and then burn the gas in a gas turbine followed by a steam cycle. The attraction of this from the standpoint of carbon sequestration is that the processing involved 
puts you in a position to do an additional step that grabs the carbon dioxide uh, rather than letting it out into the atmosphere at not very great additional cost. Having grabbed that carbon dioxide, you then have the option of pumping it into a variety of geologic formations that are capable of storing it away from the atmosphere for long periods of time. The capacity of those has now been investigated. It's quite large. The economics of this approach is, uh, let us say, a rapidly evolving subject. A few years ago, it was thought to be prohibitively expensive. Now, it's not so clear that it is. And it depends in part, and this leads into some of the economic and policy questions, it depends in part on how much you're prepared to pay to reduce the risks of intolerable degrees of climate change. If one is willing to pay a bit, the option space opens up substantially. OK, thank you. That concludes the Q&A part. I'm going to, before we thank the panelists, simply go down the route and at the uh, one minute or less level, let them say anything they want to. What I have seeded the conversation with is whether were they in your shoes uh, and about to have to do this briefing, uh, what's the one scientific issue that they would really want to keep their eye on in thinking these topics through? Mike? Well, actually two. Number one, um, I think you should be very skeptical about um, the, the, uh, the sulfate uh, story. It's very complicated, and uh, the fact that people are fitting global average temperature models is, um, is, is not the smartest thing to do to test whether this is really the case, because the lifetime of sulfur oxides in the atmosphere is measured in a few days. Uh, number two, um, be aware that uh, changing climate has implications for some problems that we thought were solved. For example, a warmer uh, surface than the Earth is going to imply a colder stratosphere, and the prospects for ozone depletion in the Arctic uh, go way up. And in fact, this year you can see very significant loss of, uh, of ozone in the, in the Arctic stratosphere for the first time. Tom. OK, so my uh, final comment is a question for you to think about, and that is uh, the role of gases other than carbon dioxide in meeting uh, commitments with regard to stabilization of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is essentially stabilizing the climate system. Uh, how important are those gases? And I alluded to the problem briefly, and you might want to try and see if you can quantify this in some way, and that is that if we wanted as a target to stabilize the effective amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at double the pre-industrial level, in other words, at 550 parts per million or so, then because of these other greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and so on, what we would have to shoot for as a target for CO2 would be substantially less than that and you might want to try and figure out how much less, you know, what is the magnitude of the problem in terms of CO2 alone? In terms of um, a scientific issue that, uh, that I believe uh, certainly needs additional attention, as, as an oceanographer, I would say it's the ocean. Uh, the ocean is a very, very important part of our climate system. And, and as uh, we look at uh, what we know about changes in ocean circulation in the past uh, during the glacial interglacial cycles, uh, during the Little Ice Age, for example, um, it's very clear that, uh, that we are now uh, entering um, a, a climate um, a domain that we would have to say is largely uncharted. Uh, no time, certainly in the last couple of million years, has the atmosphere uh, been as enriched in, in the uh, greenhouse gases as it is now. And, and the models that we've been talking about um, that uh, Tom uh, works with in great detail uh, assume that, um, that the ocean is going to behave more or less like it does today. And so when you get, um, when you get scientists together from, from all the persuasions of the earth science is broadly defined and, and look to see who, um, who maybe uh, within each of these uh, sub-disciplines has uh, the least confidence that, that um, uh, what might be prognosticated from these models is, is going to be right. Often the oceanographers are the ones who are very concerned, and not just that it won't be as bad, but it could be much worse uh, than we anticipate now with major changes in ocean circulation. Thank you. Uh, two, two very quick points. One, uh, don't be confused by the circumstance that a great deal of the scientific literature addresses just a doubling of pre-industrial atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And then there ensues from that a huge argument uh, 
about whether at a doubling you can establish that the consequences will be intolerable. The point that you should keep in mind is precisely that we won't stop at a doubling unless we really work at it. We are headed under business as usual for much more than a doubling and you get much beyond a doubling and the arguments about whether it's big enough to be a terrible mess uh, become a lot more obvious when you look at triplings and quadruplings. The reason there's all that literature out there about a doubling is primarily that the modeling community basically agreed everybody's going to look at a doubling so that we can see what differences arise from differences in the models versus other differences that would arise from looking at different uh, scenarios. The last point is in looking at solutions, do not neglect increased end use efficiency. There remains tremendous leverage in learning to do more economic good with each unit of energy, each pound of coal, each kilowatt hour of electricity. New supplies, renewables, nuclear, carbon sequestering, fossil fuel technologies are not the whole answer. The end use side will remain very important. Well, you have just had as good a scientific briefing on the science of climate change as is to be had uh, anywhere on the planet. Uh, what you make of it uh, will be very interesting to lots of us here. Uh, thanks to you and thanks to the panelists for being here. How are you, John? Good, Jim. How are you? All right. I actually had a question. Holy what a life. I actually have a second to stick around. I just want to ask him. You don't want to embarrass us. No, actually, what's that? I see it's carbon dioxide, not carbon. It's embedded.